Good morning to all those who are with us today to learn about the latest publication on the potential of business services sector in the EMEA region. My name is Pavel Pantry and I represent Association of Business Service Leaders, ABSL, one of the authors responsible for the report. ABSL together with Deloitte, JLL and Randstad is presenting to you the EMEA's business services landscape. This year's edition of the document includes well-established locations in Western Europe, such as UK and Ireland. It also analyzes CE potential with data on regions leaders, such as Poland, Romania and the Czech Republic. In 2020, the authors broadened the scope, including the Baltic and the Balkan regions, Ukraine, Belarus, and a location that is back on the sector's map, Egypt. The agenda of today's meeting starts with presentation of the report with facts and data collected by the end of February 2020. To understand what these data mean today, the report presentation will be followed by a post-COVID update offering analysis of the situation from the point of view of its authors. Then we will engage our experts in the discussion on how they see the growth opportunities of the region based on the existing potential and facing current challenges. And we will end the meeting with a Q&A session. Let me introduce to you our experts representing reports authors. Deloitte is represented by Candice Seek, director at Deloitte UK, and Olaf Babinet, a Deloitte Consulting Global Location Strategy Europe. Rafał Szajewski, Business Location Consulting Director for MIA, will be speaking on behalf of JLL. And Randstad is represented by Tanya Dedecker, Managing Director, Randstad Enterprise Group. ABSL is represented by heads of a few significant business players in the EMEA region. Anna Berczyńska, Managing Director and Board Member of Scheffler Global Services Europe, and ABSL Poland Vice President for Talent. Ota Kulhamek, Director at Accenture Business Services and President of ABSL Czech Republic. Dragos Stefan, Head of Stefanini's EMEA Transition Department and President of ABSL Romania. And last but not least, Wojtek Pokłowski, Managing Director Accenture and ABSL Poland Vice President for Business Intelligence and Thought Leadership. Uh, last element before we follow today's agenda is a few technical information. For the better view, you can switch to the full screen mode by clicking the full screen icon in the right bottom of the stream window. You can find complete information on today's event, including the event's agenda, by scrolling down to the web page you can, you're currently on. We will be delighted to answer your questions related to the conference subject, and you can submit them filling in the box under the stream window. And to all active participants of the discussion, please remember there may be a few seconds delay in reaching out to our viewers with your content. So please take your time. And now, without any delay, I would like to start with the report's presentation by Wojciech Pokłowski and Olaf Babi. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pavel, for introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Along with our partners, Deloitte, JL, and Randstad Sourcerite, we would like to introduce our second edition of Business Services Report for EMEA region. Since we published our first report in 2016, we've received countless positive feedback points, and almost every year we are asked by our members for the next updated edition. So it's quite clear that collecting several basic locations metrics across 18 countries in the MIA region is one user-friendly publication that makes this report super popular and actually one-stop shop for anyone who wants to better understand differences between different regions. But actually, looking at EMEA region, um, it's quite important to ask the question, what are the key drivers that will create a stronger business case for business services sector in EMEA region to expand? First, <clears throat> smart digitization will continue marginalizing labor arbitrage as the leading factor for location selection. 
Secondly, service centre should dare more to have end-to-end -end process ownership in their scope to successfully lead structure transformation and unlock value that is trapped in silos. Thirdly, the existing centre's consolidation with the BPO partners will continue at much higher speed than before, and the consourcing and hybrid models will be much more popular and shift the focus of in-house centers in more middle office, front office activities. And we cannot actually forget about increasing role of industry organizations, such ADSL in Central Europe and NASCO in India, that clearly show that the right orchestrations locally takes the global business services agenda to the right level of dialogue in the given country, in the given region, and address to the right level of decision makers. Members even more recognize, and this is what is coming actually from our uh, uh, experience over 10 years in the region, that they recognize the role uh, and improving the business environment like uh, talent advocacy uh, and other topics are even more visible as a, as a one agenda for business sec uh, services sector uh, uh, in the in the countries and also even more visible on the uh, on the uh, regional level and the last point which is also quite important that uh, involvement of uh, in industrial organization also into the uh, insights uh, activities and building publication uh, like this one with professional partners is even more recognized and there are even more seen as a trusted partner for the investors and also for the members community. So with that said, not talking uh, for too long, I would like to pass the ball to my uh, uh, colleague Olaf uh, from Deloitte. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you Wojciech and uh, thanks to uh, all the attendees for the time uh, you have set aside for uh, this session today. Um, my goal is uh, to uh, kind of summarize this great report within uh, five or ten minutes. Uh, this report has been has taken some months, as you know, to put together in order to have it uh, ready for you today. Um, this report is structured country by country, but I will highlight uh, five or six uh, main themes that can be extracted uh, from uh, our uh, analysis today. Uh, I will start uh, with, uh, with the good news, uh, and that will be my first point. Uh, the business uh, service sector uh, continues to, to, uh, to uh, actually thrive. Uh, since our last report, uh, the number of new projects uh, continue to grow. And equally important, uh, the number of companies uh, expanding their current operation has also grown. For example, uh, the business service sector has approximately added uh, probably 200 to 250 uh, more employees, more FTs across the countries that we are covering, and probably more than uh, seven, I mean, 600 or 700 new business services uh, center. Uh, as an example, uh, between 2016 and 2019, for, uh, Poland has added probably uh, more than uh, 100,000 FTs. Uh, to reach uh, to reach probably more than uh, 300,000 uh, FTEs in the business service sector. Romania has added uh, approximately uh, 50,000, Hungary 30,000. And this is a similar situation uh, in the Baltic countries uh, with, uh, for example, Lithuania or Portugal, uh, Ukraine, Serbia. This growth is uh, the result of uh, large new companies uh, decided to finally make the move, uh, not as early movers, but still expecting to find more efficiency, uh, new talent, and uh, sometimes also better costs. Uh, we are also seeing new medium-sized company uh, making the leap for the first time and uh, kind of realizing that if their largest competitor uh, has made the move, uh, then they also need to make the move. Second point, and secondly, uh, in addition to traditional destination to host uh, business services, such as Poland, Hungary, Romania, a new destination in the wider EMEA region are uh, emerging or uh, resurfacing. 
such as the Balkans uh, with Serbia, uh, Bosnia and uh, but also uh, Ukraine and uh, Egypt. Although uh, not covered in this report, uh, we are also seeing new destinations like Tunisia uh, and uh, also Morocco, especially for IT delivery center and customer center. At Deloitte, and uh, to support this point, we have been advising more companies to explore alternative locations in EMEA. Uh, this definitely holds true for some large companies who have already been operating in traditional Eastern European location and are keen to find uh, different sources of talent, but also companies taking a first investment decision and ready to test uh, off-peak location where they would not compete head to head uh, with large companies that dominate some locations in uh, traditional spots. That uh, brings me to, the, to my first uh, third point, um, and it is, uh, it is uh, kind of related to tier two and tier three cities in EMEA uh, that, are, uh, that are vying uh, for projects. Uh, aware of the competition for talent, uh, we tend to find in many countries and their respective tier one locations, uh, tier two and even tier three locations uh, that are putting together a better offering. Uh, of course, availability, quality of skills uh, and infrastructure will determine, uh, will determine uh, their success or uh, failure. However, we have been more successful uh, convincing companies to consider non-traditional locations and that is reflected in the report with more cities mentioned in the targeted countries. Of course, uh, needless to say that uh, traditional capitals, uh, such as, uh, such as in Warsaw, Vilnius, or uh, even in Lisbon, are still attractive, especially for more added value, knowledge type uh, job, uh, specialist process. And that is why we see still a continuous flow uh, to those uh, traditional destinations. My fourth point uh, is the growing interest for locations that might not present the ideal or lower cost conditions, but that compensate it with a robust attractiveness uh, that is appealing to talent. Because of talent scarcity, uh, location attractiveness becomes more important than in the past, as uh, it is a location factor taking into account more and more by candidates and uh, qualified people from uh, across Europe. Uh, that is certainly a reason why we see uh, ourselves conducting more due diligence in places like uh, Lisbon or uh, Barcelona, for example, uh, where although the costs might not be still at par with the uh, other destination, uh, they offer enough other merits to overcome the price aspect. Attractiveness factor can encompass uh, the proximity to the seaside, uh, cultural environment, and of course, uh, quality of living. And finally, uh, and to remain uh, within the cost discussion, uh, we are seeing all across Europe uh, shrinking uh, of the cost differences, uh, not only between countries in Eastern Europe, but also within Europe, between Eastern Europe and some specific countries uh, in Western Europe. For example, the, I mean, the, the cost difference uh, is uh, narrowing uh, between cities in Eastern Europe and cities within the same countries. For, for example, a few years ago, uh, there was always a clear cost gap between capitals and tier two cities. So costs in Warsaw were anything between 15 to 40% higher than in some tier two or, or tier three uh, or tier two city. Now it's not anymore the case. Um, and same with, uh, with, uh, with Budapest and some tier two or tier three cities, Bratislava, uh, Bucharest, uh, Cairo, uh, Tunis, or uh, even um, uh, in Lithuania with, uh, with, the capital, uh, with the capital Vilnius. And with this growing number of uh, business services centers, companies have been searching for more talent at the same time in tier one locations. And where they could not find it, uh, they went scouting in tier two or tier three locations where the base for talent was thinner or is thinner uh, resulting in price increase to find and retain the talent in these uh, in these tier two and tier three cities. The labor uh, cost gap uh, is also narrowing between countries, uh, both within Eastern Europe, as I said, uh, but as well as between Eastern Europe and some Western Europe 
uh, and, and some Western European countries. Uh, the report is not saying that there are not still some differences between countries, but we cannot uh, anymore say that there is a gap of 40% within Eastern Europe or 40% between Eastern Europe and some countries uh, in Eastern Europe. Cost is uh, still one of the most important factors we take into account in, and that our clients take, take into account. But location strategy analysis become more and more tenuous. And this report will uh, help you definitely to read more insights uh, country by country that along with cost can help you make a difference between countries and between location. With that, I have uh, finished my, uh, my five minute summary and uh, leave the floor to the next uh, to the next panel. Thank you. Olaf Wojtek, thank you for the presentation of the report. Uh, its scope is very impressive and it will be an important tool in the site selection process that will analyze the region. Uh, trying to keep in mind the points that you mentioned and thank you for being uh, a Good, bringing the good news in the hard times, uh, sector is thriving. This is definitely a sentence we should keep in mind. Uh, there are the newcomers, the latecomers, uh, the new destinations within so-called wider EMEA region, as uh, Olaf mentioned, with tier two and tier three cities opportunities to grow. Uh, attractiveness of uh, quality of life as a main uh, or important factor taken into consideration during the process. And internally, smart digitization, end-to-end -end process ownership within the centers, offering more influence on the business and con consolidation within different models with a strong push for hybrid. These are the positive aspects that we should keep in mind from the previous presentation. One element that may raise some of the questions is the shrinking cost differences between uh, existing locations. And that is definitely something we should be observing. These are the information from the report that was compiled as mentioned by the end of February 2020. Um, as mentioned at the beginning of our session, COVID-19 was an important factor that has influenced the business services sector in the first few months of 2020. It still is difficult to understand its full meaning, but we would like to provide a COVID or a post-COVID update to understand how it has already changed our business model. To help us with the task, we have asked reports partners to look at the situation from their perspective and tell us what is important and what has changed. We will start with Candice Seek. Deloitte as a global leader in location strategy has a broad perspective and can see many aspects of business decisions that will be taken in the future regarding impact of COVID on business services sector. Candice. Many thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here. Um, if I could go to the first slide. Um, so thanks for the introduction. I uh, lead the business, uh, global business services and outsourcing advisory practice for Deloitte in the UK. Um, and we're, we're truly in unprecedented times. Over the last few months, we've been keeping very close to organizations across the world um, and, and specifically in Europe to really understand how they're coping through this. Um, and we have released recently a, a point of view on the topic, and I'm pleased to share some of these insights with you today. So first of all, we've seen three key factors that have had the biggest impact on global business services uh, through the pandemic. Those three are the maturity of the organization, the robustness of the business continuity plans, and the location. Um, so starting with the maturity, it is no surprise that those shared service organizations that have been going for many years and have stable processes, stable technology, and a stable workforce that are, are used to working together have fared well through this. Um, moving to robustness of the business continuity plans, this one's been probably the, the, the most mixed. I think those with outsource centers uh, struggled more purely because of the sheer scale um, of, the, of the pandemic and having to move quickly to a new model that they just simply weren't prepared for. I think also where organizations 
uh, looked at moving uh, to a business continuity model that had other centers were caught on the back foot because clearly we're all having to work from home and that was not always a factor that was considered uh, for a crisis like this. Um, and finally, location. Uh, I think Europe certainly has fared much better. We've seen certain developing countries really struggle because the infrastructure simply hasn't been there to support working from home. And, um, and, and many of my clients in Europe, specifically those with captive centers, have had a uh, culture of working from home um, for a while. So we're far better prepared when we move to that. Moving on to the next slide. Coming out of this, I think there are five key factors um, that we will see change uh, specifically in the global business services world. First of all, workforce management. Uh, we are all working from home. So virtual workforce will become a part of your organizational design. There's no doubt about that. Cross-training um, will happen a lot more. We're seeing how flexible people have adapted to having to take work on from uh, centers where they've struggled to, to move to a virtual model very quickly. So I think cross-training between local um, and, and, and shared, shared services um, centers will happen a lot more. And we'll just have a, a, a lot more flexibility in our model. Moving to digital enablement. Um, it's already happened. We're, we're all going to have laptops. We're all going to need apps in order to um, access our ERPs and our transactions, whether that be uh, on, a, on a, a tablet, um, laptop, et cetera. Um, and also, I think the, the, the one area that, that, that will be under a lot more scrutiny is, is cyber. Um, so, so, so cyber attacks, we know, have been an issue during this time. So security was something that needs to be looked at uh, post this, but I think will be enhanced and, um, and will enable us to, to work in this fashion um, in a much more flexible way. I think also on, on, on digital automation has been something that many organizations have really struggled to get up to, to get off the ground. And sometimes it's crippled purely by the change management and, and being able to uh, quickly develop new bots, et cetera, and I think this, again, will change that. Where organizations are more sophisticated in this area, they've been able to put bots into areas such as, um, su such as within email, um, help desk type environments, and triage those much quick, quicker. Business continuity plans, these will certainly be updated. Um, lessons learned will be taken into consideration. We will plan for a very different type of disasters, I think, in the future. Um, and, and certainly those will need to be recontracted re where uh, you have an outsource arrangement. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if there will be many business continuity drills in the future, just as part of business as usual. Service delivery models and outsourcing relationships. This one, uh, this one I, I think um, is, is, is yet to be seen. I've, I've, I've heard many organizations, and we certainly did a poll not so long ago, say that they uh, we'll certainly move more to shared services, but perhaps not outsourcing. I think a lot of this is potentially knee-jerk and, and coming out of this once things stabilize again, um, they will need to readdress where, where, where they are and how uh, their arrangement and their delivery model fared through the crisis. But I think doing anything knee-jerk is probably not the right thing. Uh, let's see as we come out uh, and, and how we stabilize again. I think Europe has fared much better than some of the other regions. And finally, agility and processes. This one is the one I've probably enjoyed watching the most in terms of how successful we have been um, as, as, as global business uh, leaders and, and certainly organizations with flexing our processes to meet this crisis. Whether that be changing who's doing what processes where, whether that be just, just focusing really on the critical processes and ensuring that they are done properly um, certainly, I've seen many organizations focus on getting the right KPIs out daily to ensure they understand the business position during this critical time. And, um, and it's incredible how when you have to, when lives are at stake, you can do things so much faster, so much quicker, and, and, and be so much more adaptable. So just show how much fat we have in our processes. And we've been talking about leading processes, and we've been talking about uh, taking out redundant steps in processes for, for many, many years. And this has really forced us to do that and been a real catalyst for change. 
So I hope that uh, gave you some insights into what we're seeing certainly across uh, the organizations we work with. Thanks very much. Back to you, Paul. Thank you, Candice. Uh, considering COVID's most striking effects, we all think about work from home situation and it was mentioned many times. How will this change in the future or will there be more permanent aspects of business uh, um, working from home? Will the um, new model influence the workspace solutions? Uh, Rafał Szajewski from JLL will throw some more light on these challenges. Rafał? Thank you, Paolo. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, indeed, I'm very happy to share a few insights into that. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yeah, I hope you can see my screen now. Okay, uh, so uh, a few insights into um, what has what has happened with COVID and with relation to the real estate market. So uh, the first part I'm going to talk about is the past and now, what we observe currently. So as for the past, so pre-COVID-19, uh, as it already has been stated, all the markets throughout Europe were pretty much on the rise. They were, they were either booming or were on the rise with regard to real estate. And then that was both in terms of demand and rents. And then, uh, you know, as old saying goes, um, when the past is calling, do not answer because it has nothing new to tell. So this is pretty much it that I'm going to cover with regard to the past, and I'm going to focus on what's going, what's going on right now. So what we see right now is the decreasing demand for office space, really. And the demand in the first quarter in some of the markets like the US or Germany has reached even 30%. Obviously, the outcome is going to be uh, the, the impact on the rents. So um, the rents need to be divided, need to be split into two parts, really. In a non-euro zone, uh, technically, rents went up. But the reason for this is that the foreign exchange rate actually changed in favor of euro. Euro got stronger. Most of the contracts are denominated in local currency, but expressed in euro. So that's the reason why some of the companies have experienced a surge in, in the rents. However, in the rest of the market, we have seen the rent uh, going pretty much stable, going in a flat trend. Now, speaking of prelets, so all the contracts that have been already signed, but the constructions work are, works are not completed yet. Uh, good thing is that most of the construction works will continue. Uh, those construction works uh, are still going on. In some of the markets like Spain or Italy, actually they have been suspended. However, what we observe right now is the higher risk of untimely completion of the, of the works. So this may have an impact on the final uh, handing over of the office space. And this may very well, uh, this should be very well uh, looked into while reviewing the contracts with the, with the landlords for the future. This is our tip. As far as fit out prices are concerned, actually we uh, may witness an increase in fit, out, uh, in fit out cost. And the reason for this is again, uh, very simple. The um, supply chains have been broken. Some of the materials which are provided from the partners from either Northern Italy or some other parts of Europe or even the rest of the world actually is much more expensive to bring them down to any lo particular location, but also uh, logistics companies, then again, paradoxical situation, the cost has of, of fuel has went down, but logistics companies are not very much keen to, uh, to uh, go to those markets and to deliver those goods from there. So fit out costs going up. All the processes take longer. And the reason for this, again, is that all the administrative procedures are uh, very much uh, slowed down, that all the decisions that are related to real estate are also impacted by COVID. And then you can imagine a typical site selection process where a company goes through all the desktop analysis, then uh, actually there should be a validation phase where the company visits physically the space. Now, in these days, this is not possible. There are some uh, companies that use technology to help them doing that. So Office 360 uh, pictures, 
live views. This is, however, not going to replace a, a physical uh, presence in the market just to, and in the, in the pre on the premises just to see how it looks like. And then obviously the last uh, part is flex. There are strong regional differences in the flex office between Central Eastern Europe and Western Europe in that in Western Europe, flex office space is used mostly as a co-working space in our reality in CEE. And the uh, flex office is used rather as an extension of regular office space just for a shorter period of times. Most of those leases are uh, taken for two years. What that means for, for tenants uh, in this part of the world is that it actually might be a very good time to start uh, discussions with flex operators because they have been pushed also and hit pretty badly because of this uh, crisis situation. Um, it might be wise to reopen some of the talks with them. More than happy to help you with that, obviously. Now, a few insights into what is going to happen in the future. So just as a background to this, uh, just let's all keep in mind that there is no vaccine nor treatment for COVID-19. So stay and social distancing actually are not a cure and there needs to be a balance maintained between health and the economy. Shelter in place and social distancing are actually not going to help us overcome the disease itself. They are going to keep us, uh, you know, to keep the, the, the the uh, number of cases, uh, COVID cases at bay, that's what, what they are going to do. And as a, as a consequence of it, we are going to see a lockdown and relaxation policies interchanging. Now to support that, there are a few curves that des describe how the situation may develop. So there may be this sort of hammer uh, strategy, and obviously we all would love to see it as a hammer it would be great to see, you know, a big, uh, the, the y-axis speaks for the disturbance in the business. So obviously it would be lovely to see the disturbance going up uh, very, uh, very fast and then going down and back to normal. So what that means is that there are going to be a few sort of states of alerts which are going to be in place. Code red, which is full lockdown, all the way down to code green, which is back to normal, given new circumstances, and all the intermediary states that are going to be developed in the in somewhere in between. And now, uh, what it means actually for the future, all those, uh, all those trends that, that we have just seen. Yet another story comes into my mind when there is a wealthy man with a big diamond who goes into the square mile in, in Antwerpen to the jewelry district and asks the first jeweler very well recognized, can you please cut this diamond in half? And the old experienced jeweler uh, says, I'm sorry, this can't be done. So the gentleman takes his diamond to the next one and to the third and to the fourth one. And actually no one, uh, he's being rejected all the time. So he goes to the fifth one where the young apprentice steps out and uh, is being asked the same question, can you cut this diamond in half? So the young apprentice says, yeah, of course I can do that. He takes the diamond to the back of a shop and half a minute later, he comes out with a diamond beautifully cut in half. So the gentleman is very surprised, comes back to the previous one and says, look, uh, you told me it was, it was impossible to cut this diamond in half. And this young gentleman did that. Why did it happen? And the old jeweler, jeweler replies, you know what? Um, he didn't know it was impossible, so he did that. And so I think we all are in a situation where the new reality has significantly changed the patterns we work. No one knew we would be experiencing the biggest experiment ever in remote working. This is what has effectively happened. So the impact for the future, I have divided into two parts. One is hard factors, the other one is soft factors. On the hard factors and in the long run, I think there will be a decrease in square meters per employee. Of course, in the short run, there will be all the social distancing also policies in place. They have to be implemented. This is going to have an impact on the square meters in your office. However, in the long run, uh, we think this is going to drop. 
As a result, there will be increased demand for flex space, and this is uh, self-explanatory. Technological advancement, which is the third part, I'm not talking about breakthrough here on purpose. I don't think this is going to be a breakthrough because most of the technologies have already been in place. The biggest breakthrough actually that we see right now is with the data centers industry, uh, which uh, try to increase the, the broadband as significantly as, significantly as they can. As they can. Uh, sorry. So uh, the technological advancement is going to be home office enabler work. This is going. To, this was going to happen. That's what Candice has already been explaining. Now lower fit out budgets as a consequence of two parts. One of them is the cost going up. The other one economizing on uh, on uh, on the companies and of course everyone is going to be looking for savings. And then more subleases in the market in the coming uh, next in the next coming months. And then here we may experience quite interesting uh, situation. There will be a competition between flex offices as well as companies who have a surplus of office space. So we may see a, a bit of an interesting situation here and a bit of um, a competition between these two, these two uh, parts of, of, of the market. Now, moving to the soft factors, of course, activity-based workplace and change management. This is something that needs to be reintroduced and needs to be rethinked by the companies. Office re-entry strategy, this is also a very important one. This is something that our company works on with our clients currently as we're speaking. Uh, there are three parts to be covered with that one. A reduction of the contagion, however, also increased sensation of safety for employees who are going to get back to their offices, as well as compliance with local regulations which are imposed by law. Now, within this one, there are three verticals to be addressed, really. There is a space which is going to be initially increased. So there, there has to be more space for people uh, who will be in the offices. Equipment and equipment, I don't mean the technological enabler. Speaking of equipment, I mean the doors which will self-open, uh, will be self-activated, tap water which, are, which is going to run automatically, that, those kind of things. Now, the third part uh, that, that I want to cover in that one are really people's habits, habits and behaviors. How to make people not to aggregate in kitchenettes, how to make them uh, sort of impose a pattern, pattern which will be safe for everyone in the space. Now, uh, of course, uh, we are drawing the strategies uh, again as we're speaking with our clients, trying to, to, to help them uh, to get back to the office safely just to make it welcome back uh, program. And then all of that leads us to the new normal, which is going to happen. Office reimagination strategy is going to, uh, is going to uh, happen in the nearest future. And then remote working cost reduction, also including location in the context of where do I put my next division? Where do I put my next business line? Right sizing of the office uh, preparations for the next time. Next time is going to happen and data-driven approach. This is something that, uh, that uh, keeps us uh, busy these days, and th those are the bits that I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafael, for uh, showing us the influence of COVID on the real estate market, and thank you for encouraging us to cut or to play with our diamonds. We know we have to be careful with that, but we'll take that advice. Um, before the pandemic strike, the prevailing aspect of the sector's activities was talent, uh, its availability and its preferences. Our world circulated around, around our employees. Uh, uh, how will it change or will it change in the post-COVID new normal? Tanya De Decker uh, from Randstad will address the initial aspects of COVID influence on talent. Thank you, Pavel, and uh, thank you to my colleagues, uh, Candice and, uh, and Rafal, uh, to give indeed uh, the update on the trends that we are seeing uh, past COVID. So my role today is uh, to explain, in fact, the impact on talent uh, uh, and what we are seeing in the market, because COVID, for sure, has had a massive impact. Could you please go to the first slide? So while waiting while we get the slide, um, the total staffing industry globally, uh, you have to imagine, is an industry that has about a revenue of 400 billion euros, with very large markets in the US, Japan, and in the UK. Um, but 90% of the revenue sits in temporary staffing and, and, and only 10% uh, within permanent recruitment. 
And um, post-COVID, uh, we are looking at a couple of scenarios that we are seeing. Uh, um, that of course, uh, like uh, Rafal explained, it can be a V-shaped, it can be U-shaped, it can be a, a W-shaped. So uh, all depending on, uh, on how the COVID and the pandemic will develop. Um, we have no idea because we have to wait until the end of the, uh, of, the, of the pandemic to see what it will look like. But one thing is for sure, um, we will see in 2019, we will see companies, uh, um, I would say, having hiring freezes for permanent workers and trying to use more flexible work. So we will see an increase in contingent work, temporary staffing, and uh, we will see this, this truly happening. So we, we would also say for global services, I, I like the phrase that Rafael used of the flex places, um, we will surely see a use of flex uh, uh, workers being used also in global services. And we are expecting that many companies will start to rethink their talent and the, work, the current workforce that they have, and also try to see what type of activities they have today that they are uh, doing themselves, what type can be outsourced even more. So we do see an impact on global business services that there will be an increase uh, there. Now, as a company, um, and I see the slides are still not picking up, but I will just continue my story. Um, as a company, our main focus today is how to get back to work. We, I was on a call this morning with uh, the managing directors of our largest countries, and you hear that many of the countries, of course, are opening up, schools are opening up, so businesses are getting ready uh, to start working again. Um, and I would say then we'll have to evaluate where are we, where are we with our numbers. Um, we do expect that um, companies will make people redundant, so unemployment will uh, be up. Um, which I would say is a positive side in the sense that talent will become more available. We listened to Deloitte at the beginning of this uh, conference when we listened to Deloitte talking about talent scarcity. Uh, we think they will be easing up the talent scarcity because there will be more people unemployed. So I would say we're back into the market of where more candidates are available than I would say uh, uh, pre-COVID. So I would say that's something that we are seeing now. Now, our main focus is how to get back to work in a safely condition. So we have started to work with an alliance with both sector organizations and customers uh, um, trying to build protocols so that people understand how they can go back safely to work with the social distancing and everything that is required uh, uh, to work back into the office. I do agree that a big portion of what will be happening in the future will be remote. People will be continuing to work remote. Um, I think there's a better confidence now and there's a higher confidence in that the fact that working remote, working from home is something that can be really productive. Uh, and people have more confidence that this is working because this is how we kept our business up and running while we were uh, in, the, in the pandemic. So I think that that's a, a good sign. On the other hand, offices will reopen where possible and there will be more talent available. May that be, I would say, more flexible talent. May that be more uh, um, in terms of outsourcing of services. But I would say the, the, I would say the upside is that um, there will be more talent available uh, leaving uh, um, this pandemic. That was my update, Pavel. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya. This concludes uh, the first part of our event where we uh, presented to you the COVID effects on the sector. Um, looking at the quick summary, the two words that were repeated most often were flexibility and remote. Flexibility towards workforce, towards places and to work, towards work models. Uh, as it was mentioned, daily KPIs are um, the solution that saved the business model uh, of working during the pandemic time and the speed with which we were able to adapt to the, to the new situation was one of the factors that made EMEA region so successful. Um, this is important to keep in mind when you read the report 
and look at the data and we will be making sure that all the remarks as well as the answers to the potential questions will be found on our web page. Um, please remember to ask the questions in the question box that's at the bottom of our web page. Now, having our experts from both sides, the business itself and its important partners, we would like to open a discussion on how they see growth opportunities in the EMEA region, combining all the elements that were just mentioned. We have heard in the past months opinions that business services sector will suffer as much as other parts of global economy. Yet looking at the data, at least from Poland, we could see that despite the freeze of growth, mainly in sections related to automotive travel or airline businesses, approximately 42% of the companies are still recruiting. 12% of the companies noticed growth of scope of processes only in the first five weeks as a reaction to, for example, India lockdown or challenges that companies were facing in other parts of the world. Size and complexity of the sector in EMEA, technical backup and more than 80% of companies being able to transfer to work from home in less than five days is the main reason why we look at the situation with more hope than other sectors of global economy. Similarities to the crisis situation in the years 2008 and 2010 show us that once again, only in Poland, SSC and BPO sector after initial freeze doubled its employment in the following four years. And it was the result of business decisions taken in global corporations. So now looking at everything that we have heard, work from home may be an important aspect of the new normal, but how big its effect will be. ABSL research shows that our companies would like to transfer additional 34, 34 or 35% of the work to this model. Yet we cannot predict how the employees will react to such solution. And will there be a time when work from office may become one of the fancy benefits that our sector will be offering as a type of bonus. To analyze these and other aspects of the current situation, we have asked Candice Seed, director at Global Deloitte UK, to lead a panel of experts and to challenge them with the, her questions. They will be analyzing the facts and sharing with us their opinions and presenting potential solutions. Candice, you and your panelists have 40 minutes to show us the future or to scare the hell out of us. What will it be? Many thanks, Paul. Well, I certainly hope we uh, won't be scaring you too much. Um, so, so hi everyone again. I uh, just a reminder, um, I'm Candice Sieg from, from Deloitte, looking after the Global Business Services Practice and Outsourcing Advisory in the UK. And I have uh, five panelists today with me. And just to reintroduce them, it's Anna Berczynska, Vice President of Talent and Managing Partner of ABSL Poland. Tanya de Decker, Managing Director, Global Strategic Accounts at Randstad Enterprise Group. Otta Kalhanek, President of ABSL Czech Republic. Dragos Stefan, President of ABSL Romania. And Rafael Shaevsky, Director in Business Location Consulting at JLL. Welcome everyone and, uh, and thank you for joining us today. So what we wanna do is um, open up a number of questions to our panelists. Um, through the next 20, 25 minutes or so. Please do submit questions via the chat um, as they come up, and we'll ask the panelists to address those um, after the discussion. So without further ado, um, we shall begin. Um, Otto, if I come to you first, um, we heard earlier from Olaf, and I certainly was seeing some of these trends, where in Western Europe, there were many uh, centers um, starting up, um, or in, 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 in certain areas, e even becoming quite saturated. And we were seeing the more traditional uh, locations using, um, using the centers or, or, or moving high value add activities to those centers. Do you see this trend continuing or do you think it'll change post COVID? Thank you, Candice. Good morning, everyone. 
I hope that you hear me well. I'm probably not able to comment on global trends, but uh, I can say what we see in our, our local market. In the past years, we have already experienced that the centers in the Czech Republic have been doing less and less traditional transactional processing type of work, and more and more have been focusing on uh, uh, high value services. So I believe that this trend will continue. So we, uh, as a ABSL Czech Republic, wanted to play an active role in the, in, during the pandemic. So, so far we have run uh, three surveys among our members to understand the impact of COVID on the operation. And uh, we see that the centers have successfully really switched into the work from home arrangement within a few days without impact on their productivity. In many cases, it has been highly recognized by the mother companies and uh, some of them have already indicated in the survey that they are getting new scope of services. So I'm positive that this trend will continue. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and moving on to Anna, given the virtual way of working that, 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 that we've been experiencing, we've heard a lot about that today. Uh, is, this, is this really a sustainable model moving forward? And do you think um, our habits have changed enough that we'll continue working this way or in, in some sort of hybrid model moving forward? Thank you, Candice. Uh, good morning, everyone. Indeed, uh, the COVID-19 uh, outbreak has become a worldwide emergency uh, with its impact on people and workplace environment, both on the spot as it happened, but most importantly, in the longer time perspective. Being now at the break of the third month, uh, it has become obvious that the future ahead will be rather about more remote working uh, and would be prioritized on the strategic agenda, especially uh, that based on our study, a majority of the companies uh, confirmed that they would increase their use of uh, remote working from, uh, from home up to 25% of nominal working time, which is uh, uh, three times more than, uh, than from before the COVID. Uh, whilst almost uh, half of the companies positively observed uh, that their overall uh, service delivery productivity has not been affected and another, mm, let's say, 20% uh, experience efficiency dropdowns only up to 10%. This all leads to a conclusion that 2020 pandemic situation has footprinted uh, a new agile service delivery model with a cultural shift of let's say, immediate adoption measures to crisis with the remote working in the future as the key criteria. Uh, workplace technology uh, and uh, uh, adoption to enable mixed workforce models. Back to you, Candice. Great, thank you. And those, those are fantastic insights there. And just, just staying with the talent agenda, Tanya, coming over to you, uh, we've heard many organisations say that they've actually continued to recruit and onboard uh, during, during the pandemic. And I've, even I've seen um, some organisations that we've been supporting transition during the pandemic. Uh, where do you see the largest growth areas in talent um, and recruitment coming out of the pandemic for business services? Yeah, thank, thanks, Candice. Um, so indeed, uh, first of all, I think we need to make a difference uh, during the pandemic. Of course, some companies uh, were already uh, in, in a crisis situation even before COVID-19. Uh, let's take, for example, automotive. Uh, um, now, the pandemic has made sure that the supply chain then uh, 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 failed indeed when parts were coming from northern Italy or from China. So they stopped recruiting uh, in general. However, um, companies that belong to essential industries such as e-commerce, pharma, FMCG, food companies, they absolutely have not closed down one plant um, and they have continued to recruit and to hire, but then completely virtually. So they switched overnight to virtual recruiting, virtual onboarding, and, and those companies really required additional temporary workers. We heard already sickness was up with the with the with the firm work. So we've seen that there has been a lot of recruiting going on. Uh, may that be temporary? May that be freelancers um, to to companies that produce and deliver the goods that we needed uh, during COVID? Now coming out of the crisis, uh, companies will indeed evaluate where they stand and what the impact of the pandemic has been, and therefore we we believe that companies will carefully 
we think the hiring of permanent employees and we expect an increase in contingent workers, outsource services, freelancers, um, do a, a, and look at any activity that is not truly core to them so that they have the flexibility flexibility to ramp up and down in case of the next wave or to be ready for the pandemic so mm -hmm. companies will be much more careful um and so we expect also an increase in demand in in outplacement services because we truly think that a lot of people will also be made redundant uh, so this is a little bit where we see the largest growth areas in talent and in recruitment over to you Ken. Fantastic. That, thanks, Tanya. And I'm going to do a bit of a shift now away from uh, talent and look more at the services um, that GBS organizations offer. Uh, and Dragos, if I could come to you, we, we've we been speaking for many years around shared services moving up the value chain, going beyond transactional processing. Coming out of this crisis, do you see services or, or greater services being offered by shared services or change in those services specifically relating to support business growth? So, morning, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, our industry is by design a very privileged one because it has been uh, well thought of as working remotely from our uh, from the core uh, support that we offer to our clients, right? So, for us, the impact of uh, this pandemic pandemic situation was not that high. We were able to adapt quite fast. We managed to move our operation from a remote location. So. Thank you to everyone who's ever designed the disaster recovery solution. Your work was truly valued uh, the last few uh, weeks. Um, however, uh, we must understand that although our industry is thriving, as we've heard in today's report, and is quite privileged for that, uh, it's not a reality that reflects the economical uh, landscape of the countries where we all live in. Right? So while the business services sector is a very important one, in most of our countries, it's not the backbone of the economy. So right now we are faced as GBS um, companies and service providers, um, we're faced with the, with a situation where, where we actually have to reorient our services and reorient everything that we stand for so that we are able to partner up with our clients and ensure, like again, for the first time ever in history, we, we are a very important component that ensures their continued survival and the fact that they are able to restore operations as soon as possible and we will be there to uh, to make sure that they will come out of this crisis you know as unhinged as possible that's it for me right no that's fantastic Th thanks very much dragos um and 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 rafael you had a, a fantastic um presentation earlier Th thank you for that um good good insights just in terms of um staying on that theme um, around the infrastructure um, of, of shared services and, and, and the um, specifically thinking about digital technologies and tools and methods. How do you see that changing in the, um, in the sites um, that shared services occupy? Yeah, thank you very much, Candice, for this question. Uh, I think it's uh, I think it's um, quite uh, quite an important one, and definitely th there is going to be an impact on how we are going to work in the future. Back to my uh, previous comment, there is going to be an increased uh, or more relaxed regulations around the square per meter in the short run. More uh, flexibility expected from the tenants in the long run moving towards flex. So definitely there is going to, there has to be a combination of three factors which will play uh, a role in here, which will be a physical infrastructure, which will be a technology that enables people to work remotely, but also that enables them to stay in their workplace safely and comfortably. Let's do not, please, let's, let, let's not uh, treat the new uh, normal and the new office space as a crime scene. So probably we don't want to see, you know, the red tape being bound over the chairs and, you know, warning sites, signs put everywhere. We want to make it look really more nicer and in a friendly way. So this is definitely going to be a trend here. And last but not least, all the technology that enables people just to move swiftly, just to, you know, very simple question, how to ensure that all the uh, safety measures are kept in an escalator when you move to the 30th or, or 40th floor in your building, how to make that happen. All of those challenges need to be overcome and there is definitely going to be uh, to be a lot of work done on this end for sure. Right, that, thanks very much, Rafael. 
Um, thank you for injecting a bit of humor in there as well. Um, Otto, coming back to you, um, early on we spoke about outsourcing and, and, and how that might shift. Looking specifically in the EMEA region, how do you think the relationships with outsource providers uh, will fare coming out of this and how will they change moving forward, if at all? Yeah, I think that the question is not really about uh, outsourcing versus captive centers, because the, the, the relationship is uh, more or less the same. But I think that there might be a significant change in the relationship on a uh, global level, ML level, or even country level, because the market, uh, and BPO market specifically, has been already very competitive. And in addition to the price pressure, uh, we might see more emphasis on quality and business resilience. So I think that the whole GBS market uh, will, be, will be impacted because many companies have learned their lessons and they will want to avoid uh, problems in the future, right? In the Czech Republic, we cooperate closely in the sector among our members to be prepared for such challenges. So GBS clients will require you know, integrated business, uh, GPS operations, digital transformation, uh, and disruptive data-driven innovation, flexibility, and I'll adapt more and more newest technologies. So in addition to of, of these challenges, we will need to be prepared to fulfill our commitment in any unexpected situations. So this will be new, right? Because in the past, uh, everything we have SLAs, we have KPIs, we have services, but now this unknown is something that we need to take into consideration all the time. Right. Thank you very much, Amata. Um, and, and then coming back to you, um, looking at, um, 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 at, at opportunities within the organizational structure itself, so we're talking about new roles uh, rather than, than growth. Do, do you see uh, any new roles coming out as a result of, of the pandemic that we would not typically have seen within our shared services construct? Right, Candice. Uh, this precedence of switching to the new normal with teams connected digitally uh, has proved the majority of the service organizations has adopted quickly. But on the other hand, uh, this situation has also forced service delivery teams and individuals almost all the night uh, to change their infrastructure at home. Uh, uh, it impacted family routines, uh, daily agenda, uh, which uh, resulted in a huge effort on uh, the shoulders of the whole families and employees um, and has uh, had an impact on their state of mind uh, and atmosphere, of course, in the digital uh, teams. So we can expect new roles emerging, uh, emerging such as well-being coaches and uh, virtual culture architects mm. or even global talent scouts. But in addition to the new roles, uh, we can also foresee main behavioral scheme changes on uh, both employee and organization sites due to higher demand for flexible, agile, or digitalized workforce. So employees would appreciate more well-being initiatives, more office space ergonomics, uh, being a bigger part of a uh, community. Uh, and on uh, the leadership side, uh, definitely uh, intensified virtual management through flexible capacity planning and extended trust of delegating. Great. Back to Thank you, Camille. Thanks very much, Anna. Uh, and just, just staying sort of on, on that theme, but, but relating people and business continuity, Tanya, um, to you, I, I've got a question in two parts. So one, have you seen a noticeable difference how different parts of your organization and um, the organization people demographic have dealt with the crisis? Uh, one and two, do you think this will have an impact on business continuity plans moving forward? Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Yeah, our organization, if you ask specifically our organization, I think we did a good decision a couple of years ago. We decided to bring our data all into the cloud and we equipped our people all with laptops. And I think that was a very good decision because when the crisis hit us, I think we were able to switch overnight to homework. And that went smoothless, regardless of, uh, you know, different generations working uh, at Randstad. Um, but it was the first time that our continuity plan was tested. And, uh, and, and it was the first time globally. And I think from a global perspective, 
we were kind of fortunate between brackets that it happened first in China and in Singapore. So in Europe, we were able to learn faster because we knew what happened uh, in China and Singapore. So we were in close contact with our colleagues to see how did you react? What did you do too slowly? What do we need to do? So we were, that helped us that it, that it was first happening in, in Asia back. Um, but now if you think about with hindsight and we're still not through this crisis, but what we are see happening is that the length of the crisis and the fear of a second wave and also the fact that people are not truly aware of what will happen after COVID, it is indeed weighing on people's morale. And um, so during the crisis, we have, for example, increased our people surveys so that we continuously stay in contact with the people working uh, for Randstad and try to react fast. So one of the things we reacted on was indeed, and that's also like Anna was suggesting, there's a higher awareness of the wellness and the well-being of the people. So we invited professors to hang out um, to hangouts to explain how to handle fear, how to handle anxiety, um, or organized yoga lessons, uh, but just to stay close and, and to be mindful of that aspect of working from home and being, I would say, isolated from your colleagues and clients. Um, so I would think moving forward in our continuity plans, um, I think we need to bring more attention to people's well-being and the home situation. What we noticed, for example, although remote working will be indeed increased, um, the fact that the schools were closed uh, had to make, you know, people were taking care of their kids at home and working and uh, or maybe homeschooling. So that's an aspect that we, of course, remote working and from, working from home is all well on the condition that the schools are open. So I think those are aspects that, you know, we need to take into consideration and we need to update for sure our, our business continuity plans with those aspects. Great, thank you, Tanya, uh, thought-provoking stuff there. Um, Dragos, if I could come back to you. Um, we've heard about business continuity plans and, and changing those in terms of people, uh, but is there an, a, an opportunity coming out of this that we could improve and change our service management framework, potentially SLAs, uh, and certainly um, for what are the process improvement opportunities that, that you're seeing? Yeah, thank you. To piggyback a bit on, on Tanya's point, I, that's a very good point. We should add on, on our disaster recovery plans, taking care of kids. Like, I don't think anybody has ever foreseen that so far. Ah, right, so we got the chance to test those. They ended up flawlessly, I would say, or with minor hiccups, and we've updated everything in consequence. We are quite happy that the metropolitan areas are still holding up the, uh, the uh, new waves of traffic that are, you know, once everybody's working from home and we're no longer on the backbones that are the industrial networks so yeah props to, to our, to our um, isps um, now moving forward our SLEs haven't been impacted as such not a lot right so um, we were able to deliver pretty much on par to our contractual agreement with yeah minor delays i mean if you had a, a 90 percent service and now you have a 92 percent service you're not going to see a, a, a major drop in the client satisfaction or in, in, in the way you're going to do business moving forward with that client and all delays and latencies will probably be fixed at, uh, if they haven't been fixed so far um, what we will try to uh, to do uh, to do more of is uh, automation and innovation and in our in our business we've done this naturally uh, because we've seen, uh, we've done it as, as a necessity because we've, we've had a, a constant, um, you know, squabble between the companies over the existing workforce. So we try to be competitive with each other. So automation for us was was a need, not a, uh, not a luxury, I would say. Uh, we will keep doing that even though at the moment, like my colleague stated and like the report showed, uh, we will have an influx of workforce because the unemployment rates are spiking up to levels that we didn't think were possible. Um, but we'll, we'll keep on this trend of innovation and, uh, and, and process improvements in the future. And hopefully we will be the same trusted partners that our clients expect us to be. That's it for me. No, fantastic. Thank you, Dragos. And I guess keeping, keeping to that point, um, Rafael, my, my, my question to you, 
would be, you know, we, we've heard about how things will change in many aspects, but ultimately we set up business services to support the business and our customers. Um, through this pandemic and coming out of it, do you think is a real opportunity to improve that customer experience? And, and, and what do you think it's going to look like in the future? Yeah, thank you, Candice, for this. Uh, very much indeed. So um, the remark I want to make up front is that we have just experienced the biggest experiment ever. People were, to such a large extent, were never made to work remotely. And so as a natural consequence, some slips may have happened. And I think uh, most of the, the, the clients, and then uh, also one, one, one remark here, be it internal client or external client, it, it really didn't matter that much. We all know that in the shared services industry, we do face internal clients, which can be equally demanding as external clients, if not more sometimes and with, with more challenge here. So said, having said that, I think most of them have been forgiving in a way because of those slips, because of this experiment. But then all of that leads me to the conclusion that as much as we think about preparing office re-entry strategies, you may remember the four colors that I put on my slides beforehand, like code red down to code green and different scenarios which are adjusted exactly to that one. I think the same should happen with all the processes and procedures that are in place just to get ready for any possibility in the future, just to draw plans, to prepare different scenarios, to invest in technology which will enable people to work remotely flawlessly. And with all of that communication back to the client, clear, very, very uh, straight communication back to the client, it can only do good for a customer experience and this will only help shape that in a better way and help us come out of it in a better shape that we are actually that we that we might have been in the first days when no one knew really uh, what, what was going on right Th thanks Raphael. and i guess building on that let's also not forget our vendors um i was speaking with our working capital practice a, a few days back and a um, really interesting um, sort of outlook that they had or, or advice that they gave was do remember your customers and vendors during this time they may be struggling as well. And where you can, you know, think about looking at more favorable terms or extending credit if, you're, if your company is, is, is able to, because longer term, they will remember those that were kind during the crisis. Uh, and, and, and that, um, that ecosystem and, and, and those relationships will be so important coming out of this. Finally, um, what I'd like to do is, um, is finish with a, a short, sharp question for each of you. So it has been said um, a lot recently, uh, don't waste a good crisis or never waste a good crisis. So please give me one quick answer um, for what you think will be a real positive impact um, within EMEA business services coming out of this, uh, starting with Atta. Uh, I think that the G we see that GBS sector is a good place to be on. Uh, and in this region especially. So. Thank you. Anna? Mm, from my side, definitely a psychological barrier connected with a conviction some things must be arranged in person or if paper has been broken forever. So uh, it is opening a, a completely new chapter for a mixed service delivery models uh, to strive for more. Right, thank you. Tanya? Yeah, for Ramstadt, uh, we've been trying to discuss with our customers to move much more into virtual recruitment, virtual onboarding, and they were quite hesitant. I think uh, this crisis has changed that forever, and I see a real uptake in virtual recruitment and virtual onboarding. Great. Dragos? Well, the sector has been around for every uh, large economic crisis that we've been through. We've been around for the one in 2008. We've survived, we've prospered in, for the one in 2008, 2010. I'm not sure we're going to prosper as much this time, but as a measure of success, the companies that will emerge for this will be stronger and will have more streamlined processes and will be the ones that have also kept their own customers afloat. So Brilliant. Good luck, everyone. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, Rafael. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I think just getting ready for whatever may happen and drawing the plans regarding both infrastructure and people behaviors. This is really a key takeaway uh, for me and for our organization out of it. 
Anyway, thanks, Raphael. So, Paul, I hope we didn't scare the hell out of you too much. Um, and we can open up for Q&A now. Back to you. Thank you. Thanks to our panelists. Uh, thank you, Candice. That was a great outcome of the discussion and a lot of arguments to use when planning our future activities within the sector. And the panel participants, thank you for open attitude to share with us your views and analysis. Uh, now it's the time for a Q&A session. Looking at the questions that came to us during the whole uh, an hour and 15 minutes, we see that they mostly oscillated around the questions that uh, Candice asked to the experts. First of all, how quickly sector reacted to the new situation? What were the biggest challenges of uh, working from home and how much of the new solutions will stay with us. But there were also questions related to um, the panelists' statements. And uh, if I can well see, one of the last questions was a question to the short answers provided by the experts. Uh, so I would like to start with the one that's related to Tanya. Um, Tanya, you mentioned that virtual onboarding may be a new normal. How will this influence the recruitment process? And the most important part of the question we can see, are the candidates ready to sell themselves within the new tool? What do you yeah. think? I think it's a very good question. Thank you for the question. Um, very strangely enough, we've seen that all types of candidates um, are much more digital than our clients. I would say we saw a lot of clients being quite hesitant in using any digital form to bring that in the recruitment process. If you think that, for example, a face-to-face uh, -face interview, the value of a face-to-face -face interview is only 10% um, as a prediction if a candidate will, will work well and will be successful in his new role, then you know that an, an interview is overrated by far and it doesn't have to be face to face. I do believe that we need to make sure that we train our people on how to behave uh, during a virtual interviews and the do's and the don'ts. A little bit like we all now are, I would say, experts in, on how to behave on a hangout and on this, this type of, uh, of uh, virtual conferences. So I think there's a learning curve uh, for sure that we that we can uh, support our candidates with on how to behave during a virtual interview. Um, for the virtual onboarding, that was indeed uh, in some countries a little bit complicated because you need sometimes to sign documents really face to face. So there will be a need for some legislation changes moving forward um, so that the documents can be signed uh, electronically. Um, but I truly believe that this crisis will help us move that quicker and the sense of emerge of urgency is, is bigger now than it was before. So I would say it, um, it's something that will be stimulated both from, from companies and from candidates and candidates are even more ready than I would say companies to do this. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh... That is an important question, especially that we see that more and more of the activities will be moved to virtual or digital world. Uh, one of the next questions is also related to work from home. Uh, work from home may have many, also many disadvantages. How do you see we could incentivize our employees to evaluate and uh, propose to them more work from home and uh, this is the question most probably related to the hr topic but we would like to ask maybe anya uh, how do you see the opportunity to incentivize the work from home when you sell this new model uh, from your point of view or from point of view of the employer thanks father so uh, once we are back um, to the new normal and schools are up and running again, right? Uh, we can um, 
anticipate that uh, the need for uh, working from home will be reinforced by the experience we have gained uh, uh, during the COVID uh, crisis management period. So uh, we definitely need to uh, think about the adjustments of the benefit models in our organizations by adding new ergonomic solutions at home, uh, equipment, uh, more, more about the tools at home to make it more um, um, feasible in the longer term perspective. Uh, so it might be both uh, in terms of um, flexible cafeteria solutions or add, adding a new uh, valuable uh, tool set uh, to work from home. Um, but for sure, uh, it will uh, it will require an adjustment on the whole benefit package, uh, as well as adjustment of the uh, hiring strategies uh, um, with the topic of uh, working from home um, uh, uh, included uh, in the approach uh, uh, to to onboard and then go through the whole life cycle of. Uh, of uh, employment uh, with the home office being a significant part. Thank you, Anya. Uh, we will see how this works and we will learn how to sell work from home when our employees actually get back to the office and they compare the two locations. Because right now, as it was mentioned, the work from home is not the regular work from home because uh, we have the kids and the families as well. Looking at the questions that we have also received, we have more process-oriented ones. Uh, how about trends towards automation of processes in finance as a result of COVID? Are there any plans in SSC, GBSs, and general BPOs? Um, I guess we could ask that question to Ota. Ota, if you could uh, help us to understand if there is any chance to um, Automatize, automatize processes in finance as a result of COVID? But, uh, you know, we've been already doing this for years. So I don't think that this is uh, something new for, uh, for us. Uh, this will definitely uh, continue. The, the, the technology will, will evolve. Uh, the, the automation will, will evolve. We will, we will even adopt new technologies like um, uh, some sort of uh, uh, artificial intelligence and this type of things. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't uh, uh, think that we need to start doing, just uh, continue what we've been doing. I believe that it will probably accelerate uh, a little bit because uh, because the, the technology is uh, evolving quickly and, uh, and we are, all, I would say that in the sector, what we see that we are early adopters of the new technologies already. Uh, so, the doors is open. Thank you very much, Ota. We looked at the question, uh, and uh, you, as a representative of one of the probably most advanced uh, companies within the sector, have provided the information that it is happening. But uh, one of the challenges that some less developed or companies that were shorter on the market had with the fact that, yes, we can work from home, yet when the invoices come physically, we still have to deal with them manually. So that's why maybe the automatization, automatization of processes is happening, but not everyone is following it with the same pace. Now, let's see some, any, anything to add? Okay, let's proceed to the next question. And this is a, mm, I would say political one. So uh, maybe I could uh, turn to Candice as a representative of the big four advisors. Do you think that the suggestion to keep business closer to where it's created, created and I guess that's um, sounding like a question related to the US or UK companies, that to keep business closer to where it's created may support specialized or industry-focused business service centers or divisions like pharmaceutical, medical, logistics, and R&D. What would it take to, uh, to, to, to it happen? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, so I actually think, again, similar to what I just said, this is a, had already started happening. This was a trend I certainly saw 
um, coming over the last two years where we are seeing a lot more specialist type centers of excellence, shared services. Um, they, in my mind, are, are almost for one of the same starting to happen. And typically, like um, with any trend in, in GBS, you see an, um, an organization move to an in-country shared services, a regional shared services, and then they start global. They start with the traditional processes, and then they do the more uh, value-had high-end processes. And I'm certainly seeing if we want to stick to the farmer example, you, you, I, um, I was asked, I am seeing organizations putting marketing, commercial, um, some of the med affairs, regulatory affairs, into shared services operations and, and that's very popular in EMEA and the US naturally as these are more um, mature markets. So I, I think that trend will absolutely continue growing um, without a doubt. Um, so I hope that was um, useful. Thank you very much. Uh, looking at the next question uh, that we may have is uh, probably to Dragos. Uh, the two largest locations in CE that were very successful in the last decade are Poland and Romania. Is there a chance that the popularity will push new projects to the third tier cities in these countries? How do you see that growth? Well, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a very interesting one, Pavel, because it's something that we've been trying to do for the past years is to um, reorient some of the business opportunities and some of the investments towards the tier two and three cities in Romania. I don't think any of us likes crowded metropolitan areas. So, you know, the, the push of investors to, um, to only um, start their economical initiatives in, in the capital city and in maybe the second or the third largest city in a country is something that Romania and Poland have in common. Um, and I, I do believe that Krakow and Warsaw are just as crowded as Bucharest is, because I've been to them. So, um, yeah, uh, it, it's one of our, our primary uh, projects here in ABSL Romania to uh, reorient that business and to, uh, to help tier two and three cities grow and develop. And I'm quite sure that it's, it's on the ABSL Poland's radar as well. So good luck with that initiative. And good luck to us as well. Um. Thank you very much and thank you for being optimistic and creating a, a lot of hope for the participants of our event that represents the public sector from many CEE two and three, tier two and tier three cities, because uh, we see a lot of questions concerning or regarding uh, chances to grow in their locations. By all means, and alongside that optimism, there's another thing that I would like to send their way. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's also up to you. So these initiatives need your support quite heavily. We can't make it happen just by wishing it through, right? So thanks for your Great. continued Thank support. Thank you very much. And as it was mentioned during our event today, the quality of life will be one of the arguments that will be widely considered by the newcomers when they choose the new location. So um, as the piece of advice following what Dragor said, uh, dear mayors, you don't have to be the best. You just have to be good enough for the people to show the quality of life that your locations are providing. I think we still have time for one more question. And uh, I would say this question may be uh, to Anya, as a representative of the business itself. What should it take to use the current crisis to strengthen existing EMEA locations? How to make sure that the value chain will be higher with more complex processes. You can see that the topic of complex processes and growth of value chain is becoming more and more relevant in the discussion of how EMEA region reacted to the whole pandemic situation. Maybe that is something that we should consider deeper. But Anya, back to you. How do you think we could use the existing perception of EMEA region to strengthen and diversify the um, uh, processes that are provided in and from our centers. Thanks, Pavel. A very complex question to address in such a short 
time frames, but I do my best. And of course, uh, we should use this crisis as one of the predecessors uh, stated for the benefit of attracting more talents, more complex uh, work. Uh, and uh, some of the aspects have been already uh, stated. Nevertheless, I think this is the moment where all the business uh, services sector should uh, build solid grounds uh, and um, become a reliable partner uh, to address, to investigate, address, identify, uh, first of all, uh, what kind of demands and new expectations will come from the business impacted uh, as we are part of the DNA of uh, the uh, whole our whole our organizations. So um, basically, uh, the solid ground uh, to adopt uh, to help um, help our businesses uh, to uh, let's say moderate uh, the drop downs or uh, upward trends. Uh, in the longer time perspective to make it up for the crisis times. And uh, so, so building flexible, let's say, models uh, to be able to uh, come up with decreased or increased capacities, but also this would lead uh, that to the, uh, let's say, uh, reinforcing complex jobs coming. So once we have the solid grants, one, once we automate more, uh, we will become a reliable and trustful partners for uh, um, digital work, for uh, commerce related, uh, for sure, uh, skill sets. So more uh, customer facing uh, uh, talents will be needed in a more globalized and remote chase for talents, which will definitely be more accessible. Thank you very much, Anya, for such a concise answer to a complex question. And that was uh, our last question for today. We still have a few ones that were unanswered. But uh, I wanted to let you all know that we will provide experts' answers and opinions at the session's web page. There will also be sessions recording and presentations that you saw today. Thank you all for participation. And remember, the EMEA's Business Services Landscape Report is ready for a download at the event's web page, as well as at the web pages of our, all our partners of the publication. And please remember, there are also individual country reports from each of the ABSL organizations. So please follow us on the social media to learn more about the business and services sector in the current times. My name is Paweł Pantry and I was your host for today. Thank you very much and have a good day and a successful business. Thank you.